City University Television presents the American Theatre Wing Seminars. Working in the theater. This seminar, playwright, director, choreographer. A warm welcome to the American Theatre Wing's Working in the Theatre Seminars, now in their 25th year, coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. These seminars offer a rare opportunity to explore with the panelists the realities of working in the theatre. Today's seminar is devoted to playwrights, directors, and choreographers. We will learn something about how they became professionals, their work ethic, and the reasons for being in the theater. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm chairman of the board of the American Theater Wing. And we hope that you will enjoy and learn from today's experience. But now, let me introduce our moderator for the seminar, a distinguished member of the theatrical community and president of the Rogers and Hammerstein organization and member of the board of directors of the American Theater Wing, Theodore Chapin, known as Ted. Thank you. Would you please bow to one? Thank you, Isabel. Um, the dialogue between playwright and director is one of the most important collaborations in the theater, and we have a distinguished group of playwrights and directors and choreographer. Um, I should point out, I'm not sure that any members of the panel have worked together with each other, but uh, I'd like to introduce them to you now. Starting my right, Robert Longbottom, who most recently resuscitated the musical The Scarlet Pimpernel and in previous seasons directed and choreographed Sideshow and Off-Broadway's Pageant. Next to him, Scott Ellis, the director of the second stage production of That Championship Season. He's currently the associate artistic director of the Roundabout Theater. In addition to directing revivals of plays and musicals, he was in on the beginning of As the World Goes Round and Steel Pier. Next to him, John Tillinger, nominated three times for the Tony, if I, if I counted correctly. Okay. His directorial credits include this season's Getting and Spending and the National Actors Theatre production of Night Must Fall. Next to me on the left, Paul Rudnick. Plays and screenplays include The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told, I Hate Hamlet, Jeffrey and the Addams Family Values. He's rumored to be quite close to Premier Magazine film critic Libby Gelman Wexner. <laughs> Next to him, Robert Falls has directed Brian Dennehy in The Current Death of a Salesman, and in two productions of Eugene O'Neill plays at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, where he is currently artistic director. He has also directed Shakespeare, musicals, and operas. And next to him, David Marshall Grant, the author of Snake Bit, which is his playwriting debut. As an actor, he was in Angels in America, for which he received a Tony nomination, and has appeared in several films, including that late-night favorite, French Postcards. <laughs> now, to get this started, I wanted to ask uh, Paul Rudnick a question, since we should sort of start at, at the beginning. Um, the most fabulous story ever told. Did you just wake up one morning and decide, forget Adam and Eve, what about Adam and Steve? Where did it begin? Well, it began, I think I was sitting at the Empire Diner with Chris Ashley, who's directed almost all of my plays. And we were talking about the, the Christian fundamentalist remark that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve which is about as light-hearted as Christian fundamentalists tend to get. <laughs> so, and it just struck me, okay, take them at their word. What if you did begin with Adam and Steve and the first two lesbians, Jane and Mabel, and go from there? And it just, it was funny, at first I thought, oh, is this a small idea? Is this a skit? Is this 10 minutes? And then it began to, to grow. It felt like, wait, if you really wanted to examine issues of faith and religion and the possible rumored existence of God, this might be a fresh approach. So that was how things started. And you worked with Chris Ashley for a long time. How did you get together with him? Oh, we were introduced by a, a wonderful woman named Helen Merrill, who died about a year ago, who's an agent and, and something of a legend in the New York theater. And she was a wild woman, and she was quite devoted to, to new playwrights and new directors. And she had she was German, and she'd been in this country for 40 years, and her accent got thicker every year. <laughs> and so she loved making matches. And she put Christopher and I together on Jeffrey, an earlier play of mine. 
And it was, for me, just an absolute dream. I think a director is, when you meet someone where there's a real kind of soul match like that there, it's a matter of prayer. It's someone who I always felt I could be completely foolish in front of. You know, someone where there, it's very egoless, just the best kind of collaboration. That's great. John, have you ever been sort of put together with a playwright like that, that someone said? Uh, not, not, not really. Um, I think Pete Gurney was the only one that I'm aware of, that um, he was looking for a director, and <coughs> David Trainer, who had been directing his plays, uh, did not want to do this particular play. It was Golden Age, and, uh, and I was <laughs> free at the time, so I said yes. Um, but that was the only one. Uh, I, it's been, they have found me, and I feel very fortunate that people like Terence and Arthur Miller and so on. Um, have sought me out, and, and um, so it wasn't a sort of that kind of a match. It was, um, you know, they, they liked my work and asked for me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Since we're on the beginnings, David, uh, your first play, Snake Bit, is uh, off Broadway now, and it's an, it's an extraordinary play. Uh, you, you're basically an actor, or you were basically an actor. How did this come about? Well, I, I was at the uh, diner listening to Paul and Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, I can't write that play, so. I, uh, <coughs> well, you have a lot of free time as an actor, uh, <laughs> usually, uh, uh, and you know you can go to the gym only so many times, and at some point you just feel like you want to be productive. And I started writing, I don't know, about ten or fifteen years ago, and I just started writing things with. And the 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 fortunate thing about it was I had absolutely no sort of careerist goals in mind. It, it didn't cross my mind that anyone would want to read it, much less perform it. <laughs> so I was able to sort of do what interested me. And uh, the problem is the more you do that, the more you start to think, well, it's not that bad. And then you start, you know, then it, you know, uh-oh. Then you start submitting it to people and then you're in trouble. Any, any of the directors on this panel get this play submitted to them? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I did see a, an earlier incarnation in Chicago, which was uh, a wonderful, wonderful version of the play. We were fascinated to hear that um, you've been rewriting it and reworking it. I mean, how many years ago was that in Chicago? Ninety-four, I think. What happened was I would get a production, I would rewrite it for the production, and then that was it, you know, and it would just sit in a drawer for three years, and then someone would call up and say, I think I saw a production of that, like, three years ago. Can I do a reading of it? They would do a reading of it, and they liked it, and they would do it, so I'd rewrite it, and then it would go away again for four years. This, this was a period, it was about an eight or nine mm -hmm. year process, where uh, I would rewrite it for every production, which was actually, it's not a very effective way of writing a play, but it's a very good way of doing it because you have the most amazing perspective of, you have four years to look back at what you wrote and think, you know, what was I thinking? Or think there's some value in that, so. You know what's going to happen in about two years, a university is going to do the play and they're going to compile the eight <laughs> versions you've written <laughs> and put together a version. That, that happened actually with me, with a, play, uh, a playwright that I was put together similarly by my agent at the time, Sam Cohn, said you really should work with uh, Steve Tesich. Steve is best known probably for Breaking Away. He won an Oscar for the movie Breaking Away, but he, he was a wonderful, wonderful playwright. And uh, we worked together for almost four years on a play called The Speed of Darkness through a production in Chicago and then on Broadway. And during that period of four years, he wrote six different versions of the play, four of which were published. Wow. Oh. I mean, Samuel French published one, one version. Uh, American Theatre Magazine published another version. The Fireside Theatre published a version. So we were in Los Angeles working on another project, and we picked up the newspaper one day and saw that Speed of Darkness was playing at a theater in the Valley. And we called them up and said, we're coming. And mm -hmm. they said, you're coming? The playwright's <laughs> coming to the theater? <laughs> I said, no problem. He's really excited by it. And we arrived at the theater. And, and sure enough, they had taken all of these versions and made their own version out of the play. And was it better? Uh, it was no better, no worse. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was different. It happened with Terence McNally, too, with uh, Lisbon Traviata. There are, I think, about three or four versions of the play, because right. as we did it from off-off Broadway into Manhattan Theatre Club to the, to the promenade, and then finally the, the right version was out in California, where he, he really worked on it again. And, but all four versions, I think, have been published. And there are no disclaimers. Right. And I just did a play, uh, a, a revival of a 65-year-old play, 
and there are about five versions of that too. And I did, in fact, put bits together. Oh, so you've set a precedent for all the other have, people. I have. I <laughs> have. What happens? Do you have to get rights for each different version if you're going to? Well, I don't know. Emlyn's dead, um, so mm. I, I didn't have to really get in touch with him. But. Um, I, <laughs> Uh, but I, I just think that they, they're so happy to get the show on that uh -huh. they will just um, uh, say whatever you want. And, and in fact, he had re... The, f the final version I got was one that he had adjusted uh, in the... Two or three years ago, there was a, a, a production of it in London with Margaret Tysack. And um, he had, in fact, edited it down because he felt that people weren't... didn't want to listen quite as much now as they did in 1935 or 4, whenever it was done. Um, and um, unfortunately, I thought he cut a lot of very good stuff out, so we put some of that back in. And, uh, it, m most of it, or just some of it? Oh, back just some of it. Oh, no, no, just some of it. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be there all night. Yes. You know. I, I wanted to ask Bobby, who, who has done something which... <laughs> I, I know of two other Broadway musicals that, after they had their official Broadway opening, were then worked on by the authors, being Wish You Were Here and Camelot. But what you did with The Scarlet Pimpernel is uh, certainly not done often, <laughs> but it sort of a, a, a created another version while the original version was playing, correct? In, indeed. They, they had approached me about doctoring the show a little bit, coming in and fixing a couple of musical numbers, which they, they knew I could do, uh, the Madison Square Garden folks, because they produced the Christmas show at Radio City, which I've directed for a few years. And I looked at the totality of the evening, and I said, it's really not about um, enhancing a number here or there. I, I think there were problems with the narrative of the show and the structure of it, and I said I really wanted to take it apart and uh, collaborate with the book writer and see if we could find a different way to tell this story, using the same songs, scenic elements, and uh, we had to put all of this together while they were doing the old show eight times a week. It was tough. It's also um, not the most desirable position to be the stepdad on a show. I can imagine, because the cast did not change. The ca most of the cast did not change. So, um, two of the principals did, and a few, a few other people. But a lot of these folks had to lose bits that they had done, and things they had recorded on the cast album, and it was, it was very tricky. Did you get resistance from the writers? Not at all, no. They were very eager to, to help the show, to, uh, to make it better, to improve the copyright. And I think we've done that. They, no new music was written, but we, uh, we cut a couple of things. A song that was basically used as background in the second act became the opening number and sort of the metaphor for the entire evening. So it was a, it's a great experience. Perhaps yeah. you could talk to Bob since he's going to be doing it with uh, Aida yeah, so next. Revamping the revamping Disney, uh, the Disney. Aida, right. uh, which, which will be coming next season <coughs> at a theater near you. So I could, I could use some tips on all of that. Had you gone down to see me? I particularly like that idea that you kept most of the cast except for the people you brutally and bitterly fired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the leads. And the leads, yeah. But, but other than that, it was the same cast. But. It's not fun to do that. I know. It's not fun to do that. And you're going to do it again. I'm about to do it again. We're going to scale the show down so that it can tour and make more sense financially and then reopen at the Neil Simon. It's a huge show. I, I, it would never have been such a big show had I directed it from the beginning. Smaller, but, technically mm -hmm. smaller cast, mm -hmm. too, I would have done. I think it's, it's, it's interesting that whether it's a trend that anybody likes or not, um, there are institutional producers. And I think part of the reason why I believe anybody had the wherewithal to do this was one of the producers who somebody told me that he, ha he has owned, I don't know if he still does, a, a, an airplane manufacturing company and said, if the engine is lousy in an airplane, I'm not going to throw the whole airplane out. I'm going to fix the engine. So he said, why are we closing this show and just saying it isn't, doesn't work? Let's go back and fix it. And that would be Ted Forsman, yes. That he, would be. He was not afraid of commitments financially. No. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, he's an individual, but a very wealthy one. It's nice to know. Which is what it boils down to. He had the money to do it, that's you right. know, and, and w was willing to do it, which is great. And the credit to the original producers kept it open long enough that to be able to do that. could ride up and save it. Yeah. How long did it take you? How, how, how many days or weeks was it that you actually... <laughs> made the changes that you made? Fifteen days of rehearsals, when I could only rehearse basically five hours a day because they had to do the show at night. So we had to have everything figured out, everything mapped out. And they would be doing one show at night while you were changing the other show? Yes. So, so it, was it like wasn't a gradual shift? Was it just like a, after 15 days it was like after another 15, open in the same old show? We opened. We closed the show, uh, had 11 days of tech, and reopened essentially. Is it I was clear the show you're talking about? The Scarlet Pimpernel. Yes. Uh, but because you've all been talking, just, everybody knows the show. Well, we right? said it once at the beginning, very <laughs> precisely. <Right. laughs> I was most scared of that, of having the critics come back and review this that had not been warmly embraced at all. I thought, this is really putting my own head in the guillotine here. But um, 
we were able to change some minds and at least acknowledge that it's, it's an entertaining evening, which is what it is, I guess. And clearly what you did is a controversial thing within the industry because certain people have picked up, seem, seem to have picked up the telephone and talked to some of those charmers in the press because one does read about this and in an un unfortunate kind of way. Mm. I think one of the tragedies here is that in the 40s and 50s and 30s, certainly, uh, a, a play would go out of town, a musical would go out of town. I mean, the stories about Funny Girl on the Road or my Fair Lady, or, who, or um, you name it, Camelot, uh, were so appalling. And, and then they came to New York and they were big hits. But the, the, the shakedown of the thing that you had, I mean, it's horrible to have it stretched over eight years because you forget why you first wrote the play. But I think that that has been taken away from us. And uh, um, Mr. Sondheim uh, says that that, that uh, whole process, which was fabulous in this country, has been uh, taken away and um, and nothing replaces it so you you're you're a hit and miss thing and they give you three weeks of previews and bang you're on and you've got to be fabulous we're also out of town too if you are out of town it it, uh, it seems to be once it's open it's sort of it, we're told back here yes it's e either it's a hit or it's a flop and that's it and it rarely changes and so where is that place where you can work on it and you can do the create I don't think it's there anymore. Well, although interesting I had a play that called when it was in New York at the WPA it was called The Naked Truth and when it first opened it was pretty much a mess and it but but a very educational mess for me and then we did another whole other version of it up at ART in Cambridge, where I changed the title, and it was called The Naked Eye, just to confuse Playbill bios endlessly. <laughs> and it was a wonderful opportunity <coughs> to work on the same material with actually some of the same cast members. And so I think ultimately I'm going to try and do a third version that might return to New York. But so I did have that opportunity, thanks to a lot of wonderful kind of not-for-profit institutional theaters, that there are people who are, it's rare, but who will take a second chance on a previously produced work. It's interesting because I just had a call the other day from a playwright, a uh, terrific playwright who, who had a play done two seasons ago which had gotten fairly great reviews except from one paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's very passionate about the play and wants it to be re-looked at again. And um, I said, absolutely, I'll look at it. But my fear was, will anybody take another chance on it? You know, would someone take another chance? Specifically, only two years ago, but would anyone take a chance to, to say, you know what, he's able to look at it again or we'll rearrange it? It's a shame. They should, we should be able to look at it again. It should happen. I don't know if producers are out there willing to take the chance. There should be another life. Or absolutely. You I don't can't know how you can do that, but it's something I think that everybody ought to think about. Right. But don't you think there's, there's this, but there is this current trend, which I think is going to be very interesting, where there is no such thing as anymore as an ultimate flop bomb musical that just goes away. There's always going to be somebody that goes, you know, <coughs> I can make that musical work in Seattle or Omaha or s Chicago and Seattle. So, I mean, I'm waiting, you know, Cape Man is hours from being revived somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in America right now, encores. Or, it, and I'm saying that almost about every show that's sort of deemed an interesting failure. Mm -hmm is ultimately reworked by somebody. You know, you look at Merrily We Roll Along, which has had like four or five incarnations, uh, and, it just, and, and certain other projects keep kind of going around, coming back, going around, coming back. There's almost no such thing anymore about letting them just go. They I can't, think. because no one's writing enough new ones to keep That's right, us busy. Right. So I, the I interesting ones want to get reworked. I think there's a, there's a lot of pros and cons to that in the sense that, you know, we, I think we've come to a place where perhaps reviewers are not able to open and close a, sh a show as much as they used to be, especially in the musical world. But by the same token, I think that people have, producers have learned the art of selling a show. And suddenly, you know, you, that's something that really has a kind of a, uh, an objective reality to it. You can learn those skills. And suddenly I think that skill is becoming the majority thought process and the quality of the show is not as important. Well, we'll we can sell it. You know, no. it doesn't matter anymore. Marketing is everything is you mean. That yeah. people, and to say what you know, I think that it is more difficult now because uh, you have productions outside of New York City, and I think a lot of people coming. I mean, especially if you're an established playwright, people come and they make decisions there, then and there, and uh, it's just so much about. Um, well, I mean, I sound so naive, but it is so much about the business of the theater now, I think perhaps more than it used to be. Again, maybe I sound so naive, but it just seems that the work itself may be less important to producers than ever before. 
Well, I think that theater outside of New York City is thriving. People want to see theater, especially a New York City production. It's very important to them. So as a playwright, would you be willing to go back and say, well, it didn't work on Broadway, but I think it would work in Chicago, St. Louis, or wherever it might be, and go back and work on the play for something that would not have another New York opening? Would you work on it again? Sure, although I also think there are some plays that should be allowed a graceful death. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think it's what I think it, there's not about Nightingales, which is a wonderful play, and how great mm -hmm. that, that Vanessa Redgrave unearthed that, that manuscript. Although I think there are, and I, what would be nice is if also then there was more attention paid to later Tennessee Williams works as well, which were often lambasted by the critics. And I think this might be a nice opportunity to say, wait, let's look at the entire body of work. But then again, sometimes I think there are early things that I wrote where I, I hope no one ever, ever gets their hands on them. Oh, they will. They will. They will. They will. But then they're all set in prison, too. But in <laughs> <laughs> My reputation, I suppose, was made with doing the Orton plays, and I put on the um, Entertaining Mr. Sloan a long time ago. And uh, I mean, I was one of the producers as well, and I was trying to raise money. We put it on for $7,000, and uh, we c I couldn't get people to commit to it. They said, oh, that play, they're awful people, they're terrible. They and you just said, well, I think I see something that you might change your mind. And in fact, we were lucky and successful and had a great cast. But the whole perception of Orton in this country changed, as a, I think, changed as a result of those two, that one and loot. Because Lute was a big flop on Broadway, and uh, um, you know it's a, it's a very peculiar writer, and I think he's great. But um, I think that uh, I was given an opportunity, and maybe because he was British, maybe because he was dead for 10, 15 years when I did it, um, mm -hmm. that people were, were prepared to look at it. But I, I wish other plays or playwrights would have the chance to go out and try it again. I mean, I think the Lisbon Traviata was spectacular in Los Angeles because of all the work that Terence did in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. I wanted to ask Scott, I know you, you have directed a series of revivals. A lot of them that you've directed, the original authors are still around. Yes. Um, and for the musicals, they all were shows that went out of town. Yes. Were they helpful? Did they want to take another look at their work? Did uh, they? I think any, I, I always tell this to directors, well, how do you get your start? I said, you know, most, <coughs> most writers, if you go and this is a compliment, have, an, have, have a healthy ego. And if you go to an author and say, I love your play, or I love <laughs> your musical, they will do anything for you, <laughs> anything. Especially if it was something that was not successful the first time. And if it was, it doesn't matter. They, wanna, they want to see their, 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 their work done and, and seen again in new generations. So I have found nothing but uh, great support. I mean, having just done championship season with Jason, Miller, he was, uh, he was terrific, you know. Was there and, anything and that was re rewritten? In interesting it? enough, when uh, championship season was done with two intermissions, and I know this seems like a mm -hmm. simple thing, but I, I said I wanted to take the intermissions out and run it straight through. And he had a lot of problems with that. He felt that he wrote it in his mind w like a basketball game, and you had to take the quarters, and that, that was what that was about. Knowing absolutely nothing about basketball, I said I didn't care. <laughs> I just <laughs> felt that I felt I was looking at it a little differently. And uh, but to his credit, I said, please <coughs> let me at least try. I promise I will put the intermissions in if we feel it did not work. And uh, sure enough, it Big worked. Big liar. It worked, right. yeah. Total. total. <laughs> <laughs> the moment I turned to Carol Rothman, I said, "You understand? I will never put the intermissions in." <laughs> Don't you? But uh, he was great, and and we did some mm -hmm. cutting and some, you know. But again, I felt the same thing. It's just it, the author wanted the piece done and wanted to, to, mm -hmm. to see it. So uh, you know, I find that. I want to pick up on your comment to, to Carol Rothman. Um, Basically, you said, you know, it doesn't really matter who has the power here. I don't really want this change. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, between playwright and, and director and choreographer, someone's got to be in charge. Um, a director has to, has to, a director, I feel a director is there to, to uh, support uh, what the playwright is, is, is writing. The play, to me, the playwright is the final word. It has to be. It's their words. It's their language. That I hopefully there's a collaboration where you can come to some sort of understanding, and and if you have a great collaboration with the director, obviously that's that's terrific. Uh, but I I 
No, I, I don't. Ultimately, I cannot do something if the author says absolutely not. You, you know, I can't cut something if he says I don't want it cut. I can beg. I can, you know, pay money. I can do whatever I, I try. But, and I, and I say if there's a good collaborator, I did uh, this new David Ray play last year, and he was terrific. And we certainly had, you know, things that we disagreed with. But I think that there became a respect and an understanding where at least we were able to try. My thing was always, can we just try it? And he would say the same thing, could you just try this? And that's that. And ultimately, what you see up there is going to tell you what's working and what's not working. So I think the best thing is you find the collaboration where you find that balance. But no, ultimately, it, it's a it, good it's, question. I'd like to hear what. I was going to go to the, yeah. one of the writers and see if they want to respond to that. <laughs> well, being an actor, I'd like to stand up <laughs> for them in this collaboration process because I find that. Uh, a director is, 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 is so important, and, and, and my limited experience with writing is I would like all the comments and help I can get. And so a director is instrumental in doing that. But I also think that actors uh, are profoundly important to listen to. Uh, an actor telling you, this doesn't work. I mean, first you just have to make sure that they're just not, you know, they just don't want to wear those pants because they don't look good in them. <laughs> but once you get past that, which is usually not the case, they're telling you that something doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense to them, it probably doesn't make sense. And I think it's a really, it's a great way of sussing out where you're at. And uh, when, I, when I was rehearsing, I was constantly listening to, you know, I would listen to anybody. I'd listen to, you know, <laughs> anybody. But the actors and the director, to me, were on equal standing in terms of what they had to tell me. Yeah, because I think some playwrights are far too overprotective of their work, that everything is golden. And I always think, especially when you're working with comedy, if the audience isn't laughing, if it isn't working, fix it, cut it, get rid of it. Yeah. You know, and it's something that Scott said that's so important, which is everyone has to be willing to try everything. Try it without that line, without that character, and just see, as long as everyone involved will make an equal attempt. And what David said is also so true. If you cast wonderful actors, they are, it's priceless, because <laughs> If, and often they'll say, oh, no, I'll try it. You know, I'll make it work. And you think, no, it, it's, it's my problem. That because if you can't make that work at your level of skill, <laughs> if there's this trouble that lies in the script. It's also one of the differences between the movie business and playwriting. Mm -hmm. If that in movies, the script is up for grabs <laughs> on every possible level, and the writer is usually <laughs> banished from the room, from the set. And in the theater, legally, among other aspects, there's a lot more respect. For, for the word, so that if I think a playwright can count on that and then feel free enough to, you know, listen to absolutely everyone's opinion. But the, but the movie people have paid you a lot of money to have the right to trample on your words. You bet. And, <laughs> and in the theater, you own your words. Have playwrights that have been banned from the theater doing rehearsal because of their input was too well, strong and it was very difficult to uh, overcome it? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question as to when playwrights should be in rehearsal, shouldn't uh -huh. be in rehearsal, are asked to be in rehearsal, or well, not. Well, they can't be, can they? I, mean, I have they them in the rehearsal the whole time, and I, I love being, them being there. And well, I agree with you, having been a, an actor, too, I just believe in the intelligence of actors, and what they contribute is, is, uh, is remarkable. I mean, there are some actors you have to watch out for, yeah. but uh, <laughs> there are some, some who are really, really, they want to make yeah. it better. And I think that the... I don't know what experience you had with Arthur Miller, but he's the most pragmatic playwright. I said, you should go around the, the world and teach, because when you said, and this was a play that he'd written many years before, um, which was after the fall, I said, this doesn't work. And he said, cut it. Doesn't work, cut it. And I said, it's published. He said, who cares? It's, it, let's go. I mean, uh, the whole character was cut out in my production with Diane Wiest. And, um, and with, the, with the, the new plays I did with him, he was absolutely open to any kind of suggestions and moving speeches around and so on. I think a lot of people think that all the directors do is move characters around and choose the scenery or something. But we work a lot um, on the text, and we are there to, to, uh, to enhance the text, to serve the text. But uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's not for nothing that Kazan uh, uh, was such a great director because he took those plays and shook them into into some kind of coherence. And they were brilliant. Chase Alexander was so important in terms of cutting and shaping Snake Bit. It was, you know, really was important along with the actors. 
though I think where playwrights can, can get into trouble is in a terms of kind of a chain of communication that I'm very careful to not sometimes talk to the actors directly. If I have, have a question or a problem, I think it makes far more sense for me to talk to Chris, to the director, and then he can talk to the actors. Sometimes you can just have general discussion, but I think you don't want that sense of two different opinions because I think that's yeah. actually a nasty thing to do to the cast. That they suddenly have to say who's right. Yeah. And the communication, I think, has to be through one voice. Yeah. And yes. that, that you, you've set up your communication and how a director speaks to an actor, and, and that I think that has to stay clear. Yeah. It's interesting, though, what you said, because I, I, I feel, and I don't know, it would be interesting to talk to the authors of, of I, I wouldn't want the author there for the whole, the whole time, and I, I respect you to be able to do that. I think I'm too insecure. I just feel like, oh, God, I'm going to screw up here. I'd rather just have them at the beginning around the table, which is so important for the first week when questions and stuff. But once I get on its feet, I prefer not the author there. Let me play around with it, then come back in and see if we're all on the, on the right track. I like, that's just me. I let them come and go. I'm not insecure at all. I just <laughs> let them come and go. Uh, but no, I let them come and go. And I mean, Arthur gets very bored after a certain yeah, point. I, I was going to say that's actually a deliberate directing technique of mine, is to try to bore the pants off a writer <laughs> and drive them out of the room. But what about a new playwright? You'll have your hands full of Arthur Miller I is, a group. is something entirely different. What about a new playwright? A new playwright tends to be there all the time. I mean, I, I've just done a play by a, a, a novice playwright. I mean, she's in well into her 60s, and she was there every day. And uh, it was brutal for her. It really was brutal, because we said some terrible things. And a couple of times, I looked across, and tears were pouring down her cheek, <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, uh, and she, you know, gritted her teeth and said, okay, all right, and she went out and she rewrote a scene, and, uh, and uh, f uh, I admire her a lot to do that at her age, and uh, uh, Joan Vale Thorne is a play with uh, Franny Sternhagen, and, and I just think that um, it, uh, it, it's, it's tough. It mm -hmm. can be very tough, and, uh, but I don't think you want to get to where John Osborne finished up, where, who wouldn't have a word or a comma cut. And as a result, his plays got worse and worse and worse and were so boring by the end that uh, um, he deserved everything he got. Well, I think play, a lot. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the playwright can be put in restraints, but still kept in the yeah. room. <laughs> that is, uh, what I find can be exciting is what I'm, which is why I, I think a playwright should be very careful about interfering. But if I can watch the play, I can or watch the rehearsals. It's very helpful because I can see what's not working and try and avoid as much later humiliation as, right. as quickly as possible. And that there are some moments where it's exciting because I can think of something and then tell the director, can tell the actors, and it happens all at the same time. And it's wonderful to be able to build on a moment like it's that. It's important for that to happen, but I think too many actors reach for results much too quickly, which can often be the wrong result, which makes the playwright nervous. Right. And I, I prefer also to have some time very much alone with the company and I, show things. I, I do generally as well. And I think, you know, I, I prefer to sort of, I, the playwright's always invited, and it's entirely up to the playwright. The playwright usually is extraordinarily helpful and is there from the beginning. But I need another pair of eyes to come in to stay away a little bit. What I also find is really interesting from an acting point of view is, particularly if it's a very famous playwright or a very, you know, very good playwright or a very good and famous playwright, is talking about shortcuts. The actors want to just jump to a shortcut by leaning the playwright and say, now what does this mean? What is, what is, what's the meaning of that? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, while the playwright knows exactly what the meaning is, some no, he doesn't. <laughs> Half you, time, you he want, doesn't. You want no. the actor to find their own process of discovery, <laughs> yeah. down to just simple things like the biography of the characters. You know, it's like you're you're working, it. if you're working on a, on a play, you, know, you want the actor to invest it and to make it completely their own. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't want a playwright saying, no, actually, you know, your great uncle yeah. did die during yeah. the Second World War. It's like being a really bad psych, you know, shrink. You're right. just like, you know, well, your problem is, <laughs> you know, and you don't let the patient sort of figure it out for themselves. There's a bit of mystery. That, yeah. that, that, there's, sure. there's always a considerable amount of mystery around the play that I think the actors and the directors need to sort of wallow around in without mm -hmm. the writer present. But isn't it true, too, for the, the playwrights that they are also T surprises that you hadn't thought about, or there, there are ways that you know that, the actors bring oh, yeah, well, something that you totally that's didn't. That's something I'm always saying that I think is really important that I enjoyed being in the room for, which was that I learned so much about my play, and I started thinking about, well, wait a minute, we should have a line here, blah 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 blah, and I start, I would write it as they went, which I, I suppose is maddening. 
in some ways, but it, for me, it was a, I was able to realize the play more because I learned enormous amounts. I think to, do, you know, I mean, I'm trying to defend my job, but I do think to have a director is very important when, when writers direct their own stuff. I mean, Marber and Coward notwithstanding. But um, uh, I, I do think that playwrights are sometimes amazed by what they, oh, oh I didn't think that yeah. that meant that. Oh, it means that? Oh, does it? And I mean, Terence sits through <coughs> rehearsals quite a lot. He does leave. And he has this terrible look on his face, like this. And all the cast come up to me always and say, I haven't done a play of his in a while, but they say, well, does he hate everything we're doing? And Terence isn't even listening to them. He's working on something else, or he's listening to a rhythm and trying mm -hmm. to get a you know, get it all changed around. But I, mm -hmm. I do think that that, that way you, it, it becomes a concerted right. effort. And, and I, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> lips together, teeth apart, if you'd been there, um, Nathan and, and uh, Terence and everybody just, I mean, I've never heard screaming like it. And it was <laughs> fabulous. I mean, it was just fabulous. I mean, everybody was hurt and people were throwing scripts down. And, and uh, People said, well, that's not the best way. And I, I agree, it's not the best way. But as Arthur Miller said, you know, <coughs> it took him a lot of pain to write the play. And it should take us right. a lot of pain and uh, mm -hmm. so on to, to explore it. You know, I have to tell you, you talk about Arthur Miller, and if I could tell a quick story, because the, the Death of a Salesman that's running now was created purely in Chicago. It wasn't really meant to come to Broadway. And the fact that it has has been extraordinary for all of us. And Arthur, while I invited him, I said, Arthur, please, I'd like you to be involved. And I discussed casting with him in concept. He said, well, you know, I've, I've seen the play a few times before. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know, but I think this one's going to be rather different. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I've, I, I, I know it'll be rather different, but still, I've seen the play many times before. And, and finally, what happened was he was sort of forced to come see the play. He sort of had to, because a number of producers wanted to bring it to Broadway. And it was ultimately up to Arthur to decide which producer was going to move it to Broadway. So we, as a company, never worked with him at all. So we came back to, when we came into New York, we went back in the rehearsal room for two weeks to put the show back together, and Arthur was there for that entire two-week period. Well, I can tell you that first day of rehearsal, you know, what, and obviously we knew he liked the production, or it wouldn't have been on Broadway, but sort of sitting there, you know, that was the most nervous I've ever been, was sitting through that first rehearsal with Arthur Miller. And of course, you know, he put, uh, 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 you know, as John said, he puts you incredibly at ease. He was, it was working on it as if it was the first time he'd ever worked on it. He had suggestions, he saw things, he was adding. It was like, uh, he was like a kid. He really like rolled he up the like sleeves kid, and yeah. it was like, let's work on this play. And, and particularly in, in some of the performances, you know, he was just thrilled with what they were bringing because they were things he'd never seen before or had imagined in his work. How different was the play from Chicago to New York? Not very. It was, it, was, it was very much the same production. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the funniest things was at the end of the first day, you know, we, we, we kind of read through the play and he saw a lot of the interpretation we were doing there. He took all these notes on a legal pad and he left the, the legal pad there and all the cats went up <laughs> and they ripped the pages of the legal pad off so they could have a framed uh, notepad from Arthur Miller. <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting what she's saying. It's nice to hear because I, I think it's I think directors want I think the directors really want the playwright to yeah. like what they're doing and to to really say yes, you are connecting with my piece or yes, and it, it's it's always nerve wracking because you want to please them Absolutely. too. You want them to say I really like what you're doing. I mean, if they don't, it's like your parents saying no. You know, so it's 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 a very nerve wracking but extremely uplifting, wonderful moment when they say, you know what, that's terrific, or I like that, or that's true, let, can we try this a little bit, you know, and, and I, mm -hmm. I really uh, uh, lean heavily on the playwright, speci especially toward the end, as you said, to have the third eye, because after a while I, I can't see it yeah, as much, it. and they, he, they come in and yeah. they can shape, and I go, I want that, I, and sometimes I agree, sometimes I disagree, but for the most part it's like terrific, mm -hmm. great. More times than not, when the playwright has been out of the room for 10 days or something, or <coughs> eight days, you know, a long rehearsal period, when they come back in, it's fantastic because yeah. they really are able to look at it. And, and you've gotten through the boring bits, right. which is really staging and having to listen to actors ask these interminable questions about the characters. And then uh, finally, you know, the playwright can come in and see the work in some shape and really usually kick it into another Absolutely. place. Absolutely. And almost every playwright I've ever worked with has been able to it's do that. Always kicked it to the next. It's always an exciting place because they've kicked it into right. the next place. But also, part part when you accept the job, you're going to be the director. Uh, how much? How many meetings do you have with the playwright? How do you know that you both are 
thinking along the same lines, of director it, and player. It really depends on the playwright and the play, you know, sometimes. So that you have it really settled in until you've had a discussion with the playwright. I, I had a playwright once say to me uh, in a first meeting, why don't you tell me the story of my play, mm -hmm. and I'll see if it matches my <sighs> story of my oh play. Oh, my God. I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> you? No. <laughs> and it was actually sort of a handy device uh, for sort of making sure that we were sort of on the same track, just in the telling the story of the play. There's a story, I, I hope Arthur won't be offended by me telling of, of, of him doing um, uh, that play, um, oh, I can't remember its title, in London with Alec Guinness and, uh, um, and uh, Tony Quayle, the play, the Jewish play, about the, a Jewish play. Um, the play. Uh, no, 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 the one about um, the being sent to the concentration. Inc incident the incident, incident at Vichy. Vichy, and uh, Arthur Miller was there, and uh, Tony Quayle and Alec Guinness, and I think Peter Wood directed. And Arthur ran up from the audience and said, no, this play is about this, and it's about this, and it's about this. And Alec looked at him and said, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> That's being but secure. For, but for English people, <coughs> theatre is a blood sport. So, I mean, you know, it's, if you can kill, you can kill. I, I wanted to follow up on Isabel's question. Both Scott and, and Bobby have, in recent seasons, mounted on Broadway in a commercial setting a brand new American musical, which... Um, must have been hard experiences in both I I instances, but sort of following up on the when did you get involved with the process question, how did those, how did those shows come about? Well, Sideshow was a, an idea I had had based on seeing these, these two girls in this movie they'd made years ago, and it had haunted me and stayed with me, and I did research on Can them. Can I go back even first before that? How did you get to Sideshow? Where do you come from? Where do I come from? Yeah. I'm a dancer. I danced in Broadway shows and national tours and worked my way up that way. Knew one day I would stop dancing and choreograph okay. shows and direct. Um, so I had a good friend, Bill Russell, who wrote the book and lyrics to a show off Broadway I did called Pageant. And he also became interested in this. And we approached a composer and we worked together for six years. I was never not involved in that process. Um, I've yet to have a, a show where someone said, do you like this musical or would you like to direct this play? It's been more, I've been there from the get-go and helped shape the piece and helped decide what stays, what goes, which, which ends up it, to be a little more stage ready at the end mm -hmm. because I've uh, helped um, structure it pretty much. We did, uh, uh, with Steel Pier, we, we actually I came up with this idea of doing a, a musicalizing They Shoot Horses, <laughs> Don't They? And uh, it was a story I always liked, and we all agreed on it, uh, Candor and Ev, and we approached Candor and Ev on it. And, and over the period of time, we started doing all this research on marathons and just uh, tons and tons of research as we were trying to get the rights to They Shoot Horses, don't they? Ultimately, we could not get the rights uh, to They Shoot Horses. So, but by that time, we had done so much research that we literally sat on the living room floor, the author and uh, Susan and myself, and sat and said, you know what? why don't we now take the characters and some of the information we know and let's try to create something from scratch. And that's literally how it happened. I think the difficult thing is we didn't have an out-of-town tryout. It's, it's uh, for a musical. Uh, it's, it's so expensive, but I feel it's so important. It doesn't mean it would guarantee anything. Uh, what we did do was a workshop, which I still feel very strongly about workshops, but I also think they're also dangerous because you're in a very small protective room, mm -hmm. and what is in a room does not mean it's going to translate on stage, and you don't, you never know. And, uh, and so I would still actually encourage, uh, for myself, I would still encourage myself to say, yes, I want to do a workshop, but to be a little more careful. But it's a catch-22, so you go out of town, some producers don't want to do that any longer, and, and there's no guarantee, and you know, it's tough. It's very one, good. One, um, aspect of going out of town always was you could invite your friends to come out of town. Emlyn Williams apparently went to see South Pacific and cut South Pacific for his friends Rogers and Hammerstein and Josh Logan. Um, who, do you, who, who, do you, who do you lean to lean on to help with feedback and stuff like that in a, in a fishbowl like previewing on Broadway? It's, it's tough because you, as Dave would say, everyone has an opinion and, and they're all just swarming down. I, the most horrifying thing I'd ever experienced was during Steel Pier. I would actually get letters, we all would get letters, from people, from Joe Blow from <laughs> Illinois, saying, well, this is what's wrong with it. <laughs> and, and call me if you want me to give you any more <laughs> suggestions. And you look at these letters and you're just horrified. But it's, uh, you try to just clear out 
focus on the people that you respect and that you have some sort of connection with. But th for the most part, you, you keep as a group. You have to trust the collaboration, that the, the, the group that you've collaborated with, and that's how you try to figure that out. But there's no way of, of keeping it to yourself once you're no. doing in New York. No. And it, do you have no long... any influence, you, it's your baby, of saying that in this large budget now, the reason for not going out of town is because it's so terribly expensive. But since everything is so expensive and the budget is so large, you really have to include an out of town week, two weeks, whatever it might be in the show. Because I, I, I feel, as you do, that there is no way of keeping it from all the advice that you get and all the things that are being ironed out right in public. And so by the time you open, there already has been that whole thing, well, we hear it's in trouble, or they need to mm. cut, or whatever. Well, I think that's the difference, is that we, we're now in a, in, a, in a world where people somehow want some sort of failure or want something to, to write about. So a show's out of town and you're in trouble, you're basically dead. I mean, I can't, I'm trying to think of a show that has, was out of town. I'm thinking musicals just because of the, the expense and the hardship with it, that actually was in trouble out of town, everyone said it was trouble, and came in and succeeded. I don't think it's happened for quite a long Not time. Not a long time. I mean, a long used to, time. I mean, Hello, Dolly is a famous example. Oh, absolutely. Show. But so I think it was allowed somehow, and now yeah. it's not. Did, didn't Spider-Man get negative? Well, but it was, negative. Negative. Yeah. It was it more like it was more like your play, where it, it died. It died, it, and, its and then first it came back. Died. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, then it came back. I just can't remember one that was. I mean, either they it works great, crazy mm -hmm. for you, Lacage. I'm just off the head, top of my head. Yeah. But the ones that are were in trouble out of town, I can't think of any that no, came for in. A long time. And that's one of the great romantic notions, you know, in our yeah. profession is Tommy Toon on the road and seesaw and he fires everybody and he fixed the show or oh. Gower Champion fixes the show and it comes in and one rarely hears about that anymore. Oh. The internet has made, you know, yeah, the phone calls horrifying. that have to happen oh, two days God. later. I mean, people speak of the production instantly. Horrifying. Right? I mean, and they, they too easily champion someone's failure. We were able to do a workshop on a stage for Sideshow, so I felt very good about yeah. the physical production when we left that phase, knowing that we were never going to be able to go out of town with the show. But um, that brings up the whole marketing <coughs> discussion of the end of our business, how but critical why, that is. Why couldn't you ever go out of town with it? The big shows did go out of town. We're with adding another shows. million, two million, million dollars. Two million dollars to go. And, and so many of the out-of-town situations are subscription. And it's, it's just very difficult to make a happen. It's hard to do the work, too, and in those, those, those work, settings. Right? Yeah. Because it's, you're just booked in for a limited period of time. Uh, most of those theaters are designed for uh, you know, you know, road tours. Which is still, there are any number of, I mean, there actually, there are some shows. I mean, Sondheim has been rather smart. I mean, Into the Woods had, a, had that version at, uh, at uh, Old Globe mm -hmm. prior. And, and uh, you know, there, there have been some plays that have had some involvement in the nonprofit theater that I think have had significant work prior to. Certainly plays uh, obviously are so much easier right. to, to, to have that experience, the expense, the opportunity to just go and really get away yeah. from it. Where with musicals, you, you know. That's what I mean, you're trying play. to hide yourself if you're uh, not a musical. You can try to find a small little theater yeah. For, yeah. and hope no one comes down. But it's yeah. amazing how they do. Well, I th although we did the um, <coughs> most fabulous story up at Williamstown last summer, yeah. which on their smaller second stage, and a lot of new plays are being done there now. And that was wonderfully helpful. And it was a short enough run so that it also cut down on the gossip factor. Absolutely. Not entirely. Well, you know, it was helpful, I'm sure, you know, for you as a writer and stuff, and it was helpful. In, but the truth is, I did hear how fabulous it was. <laughs> well, that was for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true, though. Uh, it's, it's an amazing reality. Did you, I hear Paul write, so great. I've been, you got to go up to Paul. It's all, oh, it's just laugh. Blah, blah. You just, it happens. It's amazing. No. Theater and gossip? <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's like it's 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 no, hard that, to escape. The and nice thing is, it's true. It makes it yeah. difficult to to mature. But you're a little more protected up there. I, I was oh well, telling you're not in the Bob, that it's nice. Uh, I'm actually going back up there this summer for two two new plays, and it's nice because there are no reviewers up there. 
You oh, know. yes, there are, but they're in the penny the, saver. In the penny saver. <laughs> <laughs> you try not to look at the penny saver oh, no, in Williamstown. Except they're sort of wonderful because the critics, they're the most local critics imaginable. So they're either incredibly nice to everyone at all times <laughs> or they're the most bitter human beings <laughs> alive because they're writing for the penny saver. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, it's a, it's a refreshing glimpse at yeah. a whole other response. But also, uh, Bobby and I are, are working on a project which hasn't, it, there's an outline of it. This is a, a version of Flower Drum Song. There's an outline of it. As far as I know, that's all there is. It's been in the paper four or five times already. For some reason, it's so intriguing to, to members of the press to write about it, and we're going to get a call. I mean, there's a first act. It's coming. The first yes, it's I'm, coming. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> no, but, but I think it's different. You know, I mean, it's all very well to say that uh, plays, uh, it's easier with plays, but if it's a, a, a new play, that's headed for Broadway, the expense is just, just as high, uh, and you, you, you're at the mercy of all that nonsense out of town, um, just as much as you are with a musical. I mean, it's, it can be lethal. Uh, but I think I, I, as a director, have what I call three or four torpedoes, people who come in who just tell me <coughs> what they think, and if they confirm what I think, I'm in deep trouble uh, when it's negative. Uh, Do you have directors? That I am always interested in directors do you have directors that you actually trust? And I, we have, we're such a, <laughs> I know it seems like a funny s uh, and, uh, story, but we, we're such an odd group, we I are. think. It's it's very odd, and it's really horrible, because it's there terrible. are directors I, on this panel that I truly respect. And, but we never communicate, we never, and you would think we should, because we all go through the same problems. And it, I always just want to ask other directors, or do you have other directors that you say, I trust you, would you please come in and just take a look at this? Um, it's funny, it's a phone call. People could, because that is certainly Where do you learn to direct, other than as an actor? Is, where, do you st where do you start before you're chosen to be a director? Uh, uh, so. I was an actor, and I sort of thought, well, I can do better than that. No, no. <laughs> uh, no, that is uh, part of it, I'm please, afraid. Yes. It is part of it. Majority of us. our um, uh, I uh, playwrights and I just, uh, actors. I, I, I was an actor, and I was putting this production of Entertaining Mr. Sloan together, and Joe Maha, the late Joe Maha, uh, much mourned by me, um, said, I think you should direct it because you know more about this play than anybody else. And, and I did, and I found I liked it, and it was a success, and um, I never looked back. How long have you been an actor before that? I'm very old. I think about <laughs> 20 years. I, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, 15 uh -huh. years. Something like that. 15 years. 15, 16 years. That's an interesting. What about? I uh, think that I was an actor. And uh, I, I, I must say, I had the, sort of the same feeling was after working with certain direct, some directors, I thought, you know what? I think I can do that. <laughs> I think I, and I'm very fortunate, I think, uh, with uh, pros and cons of, of directing, uh, I, but I, I feel my strength is that I understand actors, and uh, that you you can you'll never forget being on the other side, never. No. And you you under so I have a true understanding of what an actor goes through, and that's something that I, I don't think I would have had had I not been an actor prior to that. And uh, I often say that when you go into a rehearsal situation, an actor comes in and there's a wall and it's halfway, and it will either come down very slowly or it will go up very fast. And once it goes up, it will never come back down. And so it's just that trust that you have to start working with an actor so that wall starts coming down so there's a give and take. And, and I know I felt that as an actor. You know, the moment you got in there, you knew, oh, the director doesn't know what they're doing. Forget it. I'm protecting myself. Mm -hmm. Uda Hagen always said, you're in this class to become director proof because most directors mm -hmm. don't know what they're doing. And it's true. So uh, that's it was interesting. In, in a previous incarnation, I was an uh, assistant to Alan Arkin and on the Sunshine Boys, the original production of the Sunshine Boys. Alan, as a director, knew actors. And the opening night in New York, Jack Albertson was blowing the performance. And in those days, opening night was a real thing. Oh, yeah. And he went backstage at intermission and talked to Jack Albertson. And I remember thinking to myself, a director is going backstage to talk to an actor halfway through the opening night performance. He knew. He had an instinct. He knew that that actor, at that point, you know, whatever was going on, he, as an, as an actor, could say something to that guy and Going fix the second track. act. I was... I have such admiration for him, I would have been in a bar drunk. <laughs> that would have been my logical response in the circumstances of that one. Yes, I would have been drunk. Uh, I don't even see beyond the first scene. I think it's sort of... <laughs> but now we don't have opening nights like that. I mean, it's a, a seven... It's a marathon of... Uh, marathon, yes. horse race. Yeah. I mean, it just... You have, you have to get the actors back up there, and they have to ride yeah. again, and I'm back up there, and... 
Uh, you know, they got a cold the, the, on the yeah. third performance. Happens to be the very important performance. And you know, it's funny as an as an actor, I always felt that I did my you know my worst work in front of critics, and I thought this was unique to me. My panic, you know, uh, attacks and. Uh, in, in watching, being able to be on the other side of it, I realized that I am, it's probably true, I think critics see actors in their absolute mm -hmm. worst light. There's no question that they, you know, once the critics are gone, suddenly they're like, ah, oh, they relax, and the show, <coughs> it, it's astonishing to me. It improves beyond belief. It's a pity it's that it's we a, don't have they the really opening nights. Someone really should do a story about going back to see a show, you know, three months after, and it's amazing how it's much more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And for that, better. Yeah. Not always, though. I, th I think sometimes the fear factor really? <laughs> it really keeps a show where it wants to be. Yeah. You know, I built something into the end of pageant where there were six different endings because the audience voted on the outcome. And these, these guys in the show really began to take that to heart. I'm scoring low tonight. What have I done wrong? And I thought, perfect. You know, just <laughs> keep trying. <laughs> But, um, good, that sounds like good advice on all plays. Like, <laughs> you can vote whether, whether Willie really kills himself. <laughs> <laughs> whether he runs off with that woman in the hotel room in Boston. Good idea. Uh, yeah. you just keep that excitement. Depending on, on how, they're, basis, how they're performing that night, the audience Absolutely. can vote. Oh <laughs> or maybe the audience should just give letter grades every night. <laughs> right. Or they could hold up scorecards like at the Olympics. Okay, exactly. right. 9.2. I think that's great. Uh, There's an interesting article in the American Theatre magazine of um, dialogue between two formidable critics. And one of the things I found interesting of, about it is um, one of them is Bruce Dean, who runs the theatre now. And his comment about how when he was a critic, he didn't realize how much went into producing theatre. And he's looked back and thought, maybe I was a little, a little nasty. And even Frank Rich, who now isn't a critic anymore but, uh, but writes for op-ed, said, in this job, I've you know, become more aware of what goes into the tendency. One of those unanswerable questions, but interesting. Because the critics are thinking, you know, that's another whole subject if one wants to d go there. No, we don't. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> well, I did have the ideal critical experience once. A critic gave me a absolutely savage, deeply personal review, and the next day he died. <laughs> it was so deeply story. satisfying. <laughs> I had a glow. And I kept thinking, I must be a terrible person, and I didn't care. <laughs> it really, to this day, I just can't have a shred of sympathy, and it just warms my heart. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with that, because right now we have to stop for a minute and take a break, and stretch and turn around and, and do whatever you have to do and come right down, back to your seats, and on to how you got where you are, because we really haven't explored that, and how you work. <laughs> this is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome back to the American Theatre Wing Seminar on Working in the Theatre. Before we return to our gifted panelists, I would like to point out to you that the Wing is more than a sponsor of seminars and more than our famous Tony Awards, which is created for excellence in the theatre. We are an organization whose year-round programs are dedicated to serving the theatre and the community with the goal of developing new audiences and to achieve that goal, we have created various audience development programs for students, like uh, Introduction to Broadway, which began seven years ago and has enabled more than 75,000 New York City high school students to attend a Broadway show, and for many of them, the very first time they've ever been to the show. And through our newest program, Theater in School, Theatre professionals like these on our seminar panels go directly into classrooms to work with and talk to students about working in the theatre. In addition, we have our hospital program, which dates back to World War II and our legendary stage door canteens. But back to today's version of the program, which utilizes talent from Broadway, off-Broadway and the cabaret world to entertain patients in nursing homes, veterans' hospitals, children's wards, and aid centers in the New York area, bringing the magic of theater to those who cannot get to the theater itself. 
We are proud of the work we do and happy for that wonderful working relationship we have with the theatrical community. We are grateful to everyone who makes what the American Theatre Wing does possible. And now, let's get back to our seminar on playwrights, directors, choreographers. I'd like to start part two with my question to the panel. How did you all get to where you are today? How did you know that you were going to be a playwright director coming from being an actor? So would you now try and go around and answer that question for me? <laughs> Wants to start. All right. I have no idea. I had no. <laughs> uh, I had no intention of becoming a director. Um, I d it never occurred to me to be a director. Um, and then I directed a small piece uh, with a bunch of actors and found I enjoyed it. And really, the first time it, it happened was uh, um, with Entertaining Mr. Sloan and also a play of Tom Dulax at, uh, at the Long Wharf, where um, Arvin was supposed to direct it, and I was the dramaturg there. And uh, I had prepared the play for him to take over to, to direct. And then suddenly Al Pacino wanted to do American Buffalo. So Arvin dropped out and uh, Tom Dulac said, well, you know more about the play. Why don't you do it? And so that's how it started. And then a few weeks later, I did uh, uh, Entertaining Mr. Sloan. But I had no idea. I still am surprised. Um, so that's it. Uh, I mentioned a little bit before, just having been an actor before, and uh, I was in a Broadway show called The Rink that John Cantor and Fred Ebb wrote, and I approached them about a show called Floor of the Red Menace that they had written years ago and said, I think it should be revived, and it was a failure the first time, and they said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Who would direct it? And I said, me. <laughs> and uh, th they gave me their uh, lawyer's phone number, and I called them, and I got the rights. And three years later, we put it up, and it was a success, and that's sort of how it started going and I same thing I just I, I realized I enjoyed it is really what it is I just I really had a great time doing it and uh, that's why do you long to act never I, <laughs> never uh, once you never once, once you, never ever two again. Two. once you're on the other side you just never ever want to get back on that side because it's just so hard I mean it's it's difficult what we do also but I, I, I don't I don't I don't envy what the actor has to do. I have so much respect for actors, and uh, uh, I'm in awe of them, and they make me, they make me a much better director. Uh, but I don't, I, I let them do that, and I'll stay here. David, are, are your acting days numbered, or are you? Well, I brought some resumes here for <laughs> <laughs> directors if they want to. No, I hope not. I think acting is difficult, um, and uh, acting, Acting pushes your buttons sort of in a way that nothing else I've ever done does. It just puts you in a, you're just uh, in touch with demons that you just never thought were possible, you know. And to overcome that is, is really a therapeutic thing, I think. And I, I hope I have the courage to, you know, keep wanting to do that because I think it's good for you somehow. I mean, you can have the same, in some ways you have the same sort of contact with, you know, these demons as, as a writer or as a director, but somehow it's a, pri it's a more private thing. You can go across the street to the bar and get drunk, but you know, to experience it in public in view of you know, so many people, it's scary. Do you ever want to act again? No, or dance again, no. I got that out of my system, and I, I started directing and choreographing community theater at 18 and needed to come to New York and dance. That's all I really wanted to do. And, happily got that out of my system with the right shows and the right decade that I arrived here. And while I was in 42nd Street, along with the rest of the, uh, the ensemble, started putting together this idea that became pageant. And that gave me the confidence to go on and direct, to keep going. Did you, didn't you go to Yale? Did you, and I did, but I undergraduate, so I didn't go to the drama school that has produced so many great people. I'm always wanted to be a playwright as far back as I can remember and I'm from central New Jersey <laughs> so it was an odd ambition but I think I owe a lot of it to uh, the encouragement to my parents who took my brother and I to the theater constantly we were always going across the river to New York and especially before I was um, before you get to about 13 I had no 
um, critical facility, so I loved everything. Wow. I just, I, as long as it was on stage, I was thrilled. And I, but I, when I see shows now, that's usually, my, my first response is, okay, if you took a kid to this, would he want or she want to come to the theater again? And it's made me far more forgiving, because I think, no, this would excite someone, even if it's flawed in many ways. So yeah, I just, it's um, that theater gene. I think that's a very good point about, about the, you know, the, the moment when the, the jaded quality yeah. comes in. I still try to convince the Irving Berlin daughters that Mr. President is the best musical ever written because <laughs> I saw it at the Colonial Theater in Boston and I yeah. thought I was like you. Oh, I did yeah. wonder why the clocks had quarter of one when we left the theater <laughs> for an eight o'clock curtain, but it was a little long. I'm next, aren't I? Sure, why not? <laughs> You're there. Oh, I think I'm it. I, I, I actually... Uh, I grew up in, in a small town in Illinois. I grew up in a farming community, uh, and, 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 and it didn't even have a movie theater. I, sort of like the last picture show. There was a movie that, that closed, a uh, theater closed in 1959, with a movie called Pete Kelly's Blues, and it remained on the uh, marquee for the next 12 years in the town I grew up with. <laughs> so even going to a movie was about, uh, about an hour drive. And I, I was obsessed with movies as a kid and wanted desperately to make movies when I was like nine or 10. Uh, so I started doing plays of movies that I had seen. Uh, I, I directed, for example, a, a fine production of, of, of Robert Wise's film, The Day the Earth Stood Still, <laughs> as a site-specific environmental <laughs> production uh, in our local uh, park, using the water tower as the spaceship, and, and charged the audience, you know, like a buck very high price, to be taken around the playground uh, while I would explain narrative gaps, uh, then we would have little scenes presented. And, and uh, it sounds strange, but I, I never stopped doing that. I think Ann Bogart did that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ann Bogart, for those of you who don't know, had a, a, a company called On Guard Arts, which was site-specific theater in New York, and now she's taking a big job on the West Coast, and I noticed that she's folding up her tents here. And, you know, well, it's, been a very, it's a very big thing in the, in the, in the 80s with site-specific theater, but I was doing it uh, a long time ago in the early 60s in Ashland, Illinois. And, uh, you know, I, I just love telling stories more than anything else. So I, w I was a puppeteer and a magician and, and was constantly organ... It sounds so Mickey and Judy, and it was. I was constantly <laughs> organizing shows, uh, you know, in garages, and then uh, went to school to study theater. Uh, at that time, I, I, I thought I went to the University of Illinois in, in mm -hmm. the uh, cornfields of uh, Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an actor. That was, you know, what I really thought I should do until I was told by a teacher that I was way too tall to be an actor, <laughs> which, which I thought sounded right because I, I, I always had a distinct sense of being out of proportion with the people I was talking to on stage. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I decided that I wasn't going to be an actor, and I said I can direct. I know how to direct, and I just started doing it. And I, I never stopped, and, and then started running a theater in Chicago at the age of 21. And uh, I've run two theaters since I was 21 years old. Was that the first professional uh, job that you had with the Goodman Theater? The, no, no, the first professional job I had as a director, uh, as a director was in my own theater, mm -hmm. uh, which was a theater called the Wisdom Bridge Theater on the north side of Chicago. Uh, and it was part of a sort of explosion of theaters in the early 70s. It included uh, Steppenwolf, uh, mm -hmm. Wisdom Bridge Theater, a theater called Victory Gardens, David Mamet's work uh, in the uh, Goodman Studio. There, there, there was just a, right, Remains Theater Company, Organic Theater Company. There was an, uh, uh, and there still is a, an enormous amount of theater uh, created by young people who've arrived from various places in the Midwest and Chicago and are able to sort of carve little theaters out of... Uh, the, the theater that I, that I became the artistic director of, you know, had formerly been, you know, a karate studio and a whorehouse and a Chinese restaurant and a dirty bookstore. <laughs> and and uh, it, it had the equally uh, glamorous life of becoming an off-loop theater <laughs> in the early 70s. And I just started directing plays and, and staying in the rehearsal room and, and, and uh, very lucky. I wanted to ask something that I think y you talked about earlier, that you were the dramaturg at one point of the, right. the Long Wharf Theater. I've always been a little confused as to what that is. I mean, maybe it's what Scott was talking about of the directors who will come and see the shows and help you with it. But uh, if what? you're confused, I'm even more confused. Uh, <laughs> and you were one. I was one. You just uh, read plays and you uh, s s decide whether this is a play that is right for your theater. And then you work with a playwright and try to improve it. And that can be dangerous or not dangerous. You know, you d we weren't able to do readings too often up there. Uh, but we, we worked on this play. and. Uh, on these plays and um, got them ready for um, for the for the director, 
and um, hopefully we did some good. And I think we did some good because we were not able to have tryouts and so on. Um, I think this, earlier I said, you know, how plays have a problem coming to Broadway. Um, and I think that one of the reasons there's a, such an influx of British plays is because they are there mounted in England. Um, and they are rehearsed and beautifully acted, and the producers say, well, let's take this and bring it over here. Whereas uh, uh, there's a dearth of a new American place on Broadway uh, because they, we haven't been able to have a shakedown. We, uh, uh, and it's very sad for me, um, though I speak funny, I'm not uh, English, um, uh, that, uh, that American playwrights are always delegated off Broadway, and um, uh, European plays are always put on Broadway, and it seems to me very unfair. Um, there's only one American play on Broadway this season, as far as I, can, I know. Well, there was one I did, which didn't last very long, but um, mm -hmm. Sideman was, is the only American well, play. Well, who's behind that decision, do you think? Is it audiences? Is it critics? Are, are it producers? producers? I think it's producers, it mainly. Producers. I mean, you, people jump all over the British. That's not their fault. They're asked to come to America and paid a huge amount of money. Um, and why shouldn't they? You know, I mean, I, I don't like it too much, but... Uh, uh, the producers see this production in London, and uh, there's some very go-ahead English producers like Robert Fox, and he says, I can take this over for six months or four months and make a great deal of money. And also, they, are, um, they have movie stars stuck into them. Uh, you know, you have um, uh, Liam Neeson or Judi Dench or, or whoever. And that, that is a, a, a way in to, to finding an audience. Do you think part of it, though, is the expectation of, of Broadway? I mean, I saw S Snake Bit the other night, and, and part of what I enjoyed about it was, uh, was a little sense of discovery. I mean, it's opened, it's gotten good reviews, it's being, you know, people know about it. But going into the Century Theater on 15th Street and seeing a cozy place, and a play that you know is uh, is in a sort of conventional set. I mean, you can access actually doors and things like that. And I thought to myself, I think there was a time when plays like that would be done on Broadway. But I wonder if you know if someone had said, "I want that play on Broadway, not off Broadway," would you have been enthusiastic about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> I would have gratefully thanked them, but you know. No, I I think that it would be very dangerous. I mean, I think Broadway has expectations that are that are. Uh, commercially, you know, generated, but are, uh, you know, make it difficult. Um, you can do a very, you know, you see a small play on Broadway, what is essentially a small play, and somehow they've done something to the set to indicate that this is a Broadway show, you know, and that's why you spent all this money. And the notion that an intimate evening of theater, uh, uh, which is what must, uh, you know, uh, Death of a Salesman, Glass Menagerie, the, the millions of plays that were done in this country that was the great heyday of the, that kind of theater uh, isn't somehow worthy of Broadway is, is, a, is, I think, a really dangerous notion, at least to playwrights. Well, what, they, sorry, in the English productions, they come over and it's a completely domestic play until the last few minutes when the set opens. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. oh, that's Broadway, and then yeah. it closes again. I mean, it's, uh, it's absurd, I think. You yeah. know, what's that suddenly... What is that thing opening there and closing yeah. and s doing searchlights on us? Years ago, I did a, a play called Bent, and the first time we did it was at the o o Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference, and we used module sets, just great. little things. And it was, uh, it was a great evening in the theater. It, it was, was a great moment. Of that play, yeah. And then we did it on Broadway, and it was a wonderful production, and I very, was very proud of it, but um, I wasn't responsible for it, but my part of it. But I mean that we, it became a huge set, you know, things moved in and things were rolled out and they always got stuck because it was 1980 and nothing worked well then. And, but the point is that it didn't need that. And it probably would have been in some ways a more uh, accessible evening if they didn't do that. But, but it was Broadway. We also are getting pressured on, I mean, I don't know how everyone else feels, but every project that I've worked on or working on, is, the producers are always mentioning names, always. Oh, well. Always. It's a given now. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, we'd like to do this, but we need a name. Yeah. You know, and, and it's off-Broadway also now, you know, unless it's a production that I guess has been, you know, you know crowned as, okay, it doesn't really matter, and, and a lot of them is from out of town. But to, to come in, I feel that pressure all but the time. Off-Broadway and Broadway is a question of economics, really. We all know but that. But still off-Broadway, they're asking for stars now, That's too. That's right. It's changing all over, as it's changing in England as well. But, Ted, I'd like to get back to a dramaturg 
how you all feel because it's now become <clears throat> almost a necessity in all of the shows now as it once had been in, 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 uh, in Russia but what does a dramaturg give to you? And well, I, I work with a dramaturg all the time, and, and they're a, a resident dramaturg at the Goodman Theatre in Chicago. Uh, and, and that person is one of the people who I trust to sort of come in, who knows my work and knows the theatre and knows the work. And I mean, I include them very early on, you know, be it a, a Shakespeare production I'm directing or a new play. I try to involve them in the process. Uh, and, and, and what I like is that that person doesn't have the responsibility of the directing and the design and all of these things. They can sort of purely look after the text. So I, I find it very, very helpful. And, and uh, Who pays and who selects a dramaturg for you? I pay and I select. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, in, in my case, it's, I'm a producer as well, and I'm, I'm, I'm running a, a resident professional theater. Okay. So, so, but all that right. is a staff So we position. eliminate you. Who pays? Do you all work with dramaturgs? I'm a little wary of dramaturgs because there actually have been the set of lawsuits in which dramaturgs have sued writers of plays and musicals really? claiming partial well, authorship. Well, one at least. Oh, one at least. But, <laughs> but a big one. But a big, big one. one. And yeah, what always interests me is these lawsuits tend to only attach themselves to hits. No, a dramaturg rarely will sue a flop. <laughs> you know, and say, I wrote part of that bomb. Um, so I think that um, I, I think it makes me very wary of those, of those conflicts. Also, I find that my, I mean, my working relationship with, with Chris Ashley, with the director on, on most of my plays, is so intense, and as we've really honed it, so that the addition of a third party actually can be harmful. That it's, you don't want someone who you have to be polite to. You really want to get in there and get the work done. So we somehow haven't found it necessary. It's, it just, it seems... I'm, I'm never quite sure what their job really is. And how, since I became a director, I've, I've tried not to use a dramaturg, um, so, uh, to put it that way. But I agree with you. It gets so intense, and then this person with a degree from somewhere or other says, but uh -huh, and you just say, oh, shut up and go away. <laughs> uh, because you, you we're trying to get it together, and to, to a third voice really sends you for a loop. And, and also, if, if directors, and I mean, I, I think there's another seminar worth of conversation about directors and writers and whose contributions. I know there have been some lawsuits as well about, yeah. about directors' work having been uh, taken without any authority for other productions of a playwright's work, fuzzing the line between what's it's very, it's the, whose it's rights are whose. It's a very, difficult yeah. uh, topic because, you know, there are... You, you, uh, I had to go to Japan to do a show. I didn't do it in the end, but there were two productions of plays I'd done in, in New York, putting it into another country, and they were facsimiles. The moves, the sets, everything. And um, I got bobkiss, you know, uh, and I don't like that. It's a Jewish word meaning nothing. <laughs> Jewish <laughs> word meaning dramaturg. <laughs> dramaturg, yes. <laughs> okay, let's go to Isabel, who has some questions from the audience. Yes. What would you like to do? Hi, my name is Bree, and my question, I have two actually. I was wondering, for those of you that started out as actors, did you ever go back and get any formal training um, for writing or directing, respectively? And the second question was, how much input do each of you have in the casting process with the pieces you're working on? As far as uh, casting is concerned, uh, with playwrights or musicals or plays, uh, I find ultimately the director has the director has the final say, but I always f feel that if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have some sort of connection with a playwright as far as an agreement, it will probably be difficult down the line. Hopefully you'll find uh, that you both agree, and, and usually that happens because you're on the same, same, uh, same road. Only one time did I turn, uh, I took John Cannon and Fred Ebb on a musical that I said, you have to trust me on this one. Uh, I know this is right, and if it's not, I'll take full responsibility, and I'll, I'll, I will... Uh, recast. I was right. And, um, you know, but I, I think that's, I, I think in the best of all possible worlds, you, you're, you're on the same wavelength and you both agree going in that this is the best possible choice for the person. Anybody else want to? Do you have uh, a Actually, question? I just think it's a good litmus test to see if you're on the same page Absolutely. with the director as casting. Not so much what you would mention, like, tell me the story of your play, but, uh, you know, just give me some ideas of casting and right. I can tell you whether we're right. on the same page. Right. 
It's also, I found it's exciting to write for specific actors, especially once uh, with Chris and I, we worked on a series of plays and there are performers that we just mutually adore. And it's very exciting to, because you start to picture them in the role. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but often they will. And that's, that's thrilling to say, oh my. And it, although you get so attached to them and you think, oh, I never want to see anyone but Peter Bartlett do this part. So it's, and then you get paranoid and think, maybe it's not a funny part. Maybe it's just this brilliant actor. So it's, uh, but it's still, it's, a, it's just a, a special joy to be able to write directly for, for just superb performers. Thank you. Hi, my name is David. Uh, we know that you all hate critics, uh, but they are a fact of life, unless you're lucky, like Paul Rudnick. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way that you think that critics could be helpful or positive in the theater today? Uh, what advice would you give them? <laughs> Maybe I want to take that one on. I'm not going to touch that with a barge pole. Well, uh, well since, since, since I had the, 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 good the, the morning experience. <laughs> um, it was, um, no, it's funny. We were talking actually at the break that there are critics who are completely worth reading. I love reading criticism, and it's, it's, it's sort of a dark secret. It's, I always find it's like reading gossip or something. And there are critics whose opinions you can actually value. People who, even if they're positive, negative, you think, no, this is someone who at least seems to know what they're talking about. About your attention. own work? I mean, uh, never. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but both. And, but the, and then there are critics who, where you think, wait, there's something else going on in this review that seems to have nothing to do with the play or the production involved. But um, so I, my only advice to critics would be to, you know, adore my work. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Noel Coward said it all. Um, yeah, we all have a mean streak. He said, there's nothing so pleasant as that gentle tickle at the back of one's throat as one's reading a very bad notice for a very good friend. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, I, I would also urge people to, to look at this American Theatre magazine because there's a lot, of, thing, a lot of, of articles in there about criticism and I read it last night on the subway and there's only one completely idiotic article and the rest of them are quite interesting about what's the obligation of a critic. You know, is it to, to guide people or not? I mean, Bruce Dean has prides himself on writing for a, a, a a magazine, he doesn't think the people who read it have the slightest in interest in going to the theater, so he doesn't care about that. But, but it's an interesting question. It also, the, I'm sorry. No, it also just still boils down to a person's opinion, you know, mm -hmm. and you can look at, you know, the same show with five different reviewers, and, and it can be very different, and, and ultimately, I always feel like I'm, the, I'm my worst critic, and I still have to hold on to that, and I feel like if yeah, I think it's great. good, that's it. If I don't, I don't. But to listen to have it one person's opinion, it's, it becomes a little frightening. I think it's what, mostly what Paul was saying about uh, the, the agenda. I mean, if the agenda is to be critically insightful, it can be very helpful. And if it's, the agenda is to uh, be as cruel as you can be so you can sell more magazines, you know, you're useless, really. But okay, is it really insightful? Because the play is on. You're not going to change it. They should know. come to rehearse. Yeah, exactly. Really <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it can help you. It, I think it can help in terms of the future. Of your, of your I mean, writing. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. it can. It's just tonally sometimes they're so mean. Well, and yeah. that, that is what I object to. That's you know. true. We have one more question. Hi, my name is Joan, and I wanted to know from everyone in the, pa in the panel if there was one person or event that significantly changed your careers. Well, you go around with that quickly. <laughs> uh, I was actually talking to somebody in the audience that came from my hometown, and it was, you know, it, for me it was a high school, you know, <laughs> teacher. It really was. It was, uh, I mean, he, you know, gave me my future, period. And uh, that's the uh, childhood in, in moments like that are, can be extraordinary, and that, that, it was true for me. Yeah, I, I similarly had a, uh, uh, an acting teacher in college who was particularly brilliant and difficult and tough and sort of demanded incredibly high standards. And I would say I learned more from him, and he sort of inspired me to, to, to many things. So there was, there was an individual. Yeah, I would say actually meeting Chris Ashley, who's directed so much of my work and being the gift of that, that working relationship has meant the world to me. You know, and I, it's, uh, yeah, completely changed my life and my, my work habits. I would just say Alan Arkin, who I mentioned er earlier, with whom I worked <laughs> out of Thank college, you. and it was the hardest and inter most interesting thing to have for a 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, I think coming to New York at 18 and seeing a chorus line and realizing that there was 
something different that could happen to the form that I knew and loved so much and saw my life up there. And it, and it certainly has informed many of my choices and uh, what I love about the theater. I went to the uh, Goodman School of Drama and the, uh, the, the, that education that I got it was, it's still the backbone that I live by. So that, that changed my whole life. Uh, with me, with Joseph Mahar, um, I did three plays with him, and it was a, a, a fabulous um, uh, collaboration, and he taught me so much, and uh, my life changed, um, and I saw things in a very different way. So that's... that's I'm nice. sorry to interrupt, but what I have to tell you that this has been one of the most wonderful seminars, and I'm so pleased that you... We're not actors, it, as, having been actors, that you didn't stay at it, but you shared your words and your directions with us. This has been an American Theatre Wing seminar on working in the theater, and this seminar has been on the playwright, director, and choreographer, and it's coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. It's just one of the American Theatre Wing's year-round programs. I'm Isabel Stevenson, and I'm chairman of the board of the American Theatre Wing, and I thank you, the audience, and everybody, the students, and this panel, and Ted, for being so very, very generous with your words. Thank you. <laughs>